Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to the fourth session of the Medical Student Series. Uh, my name is Priyanka, and I work at Matter, which is a global health tech incubator and corporate innovation accelerator based in Chicago. Um, we do three things. So we are a startup incubator. We have around 250 health tech startups in our portfolio, and we work with them to provide them with the resources and the tools that they need to help them grow. Um, second thing, we are a corporate innovation accelerator. So we work with about 60 industry leaders to help them innovate, be innovate better. Um, these industry partners include health systems, payers, life science companies, and other organizations who have a stake in healthcare. And we help them with their innovation strategies, and we work with them to source and co-develop solutions so they can advance their goals. Um, and third, we are a community nexus. So we are a community nexus for people who, um, for people who are passionate about healthcare innovation. Um, we hold a number of programs where we bring people to get, to, where we bring, bring people together to get inspired, to connect with each other, and to learn from each other. So we have been working with two organizations, the American Medical Association, which is one of our partner organizations, and Sling Health to put on this medical school student series for med students and residents who are interested in healthcare entrepreneurship. Um, this is the fourth and last session um, about, and this is going to be about uh, design thinking and healthcare. So the conversation is really geared towards med students and residents, but because the topic is of interest to a lot of different people, um, we did open up this program to the broader matter community. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, at the end, when we do Q&A, please use the chat function to um, submit any questions you might have. Um, and the session will be recorded for any folks who are interested in going back and looking at the session. Um, with that, I will pass it on to Amanda from the ANA, AMA and Audit from Sling Health to share a little bit more about their organizations and this program. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining. My name is Amanda Zadian and I'm the product manager for the Physician Innovation Network over at the AMA. Um, this product was really built to enable physicians to um, have a megaphone for their voice in the development of new digital technology. We've had a partnership with Matter for about three years and we found that oftentimes companies were coming to us saying, we really wanna get feedback from physicians or we wanna understand that clinical problem a little bit better and rather Rather than making one-on-one -on -one introductions, we decided to develop a platform called the Physician Innovation Network um, and really tested that out with Matter and have grown it to a large community of 14,000 in the last three years. So we would love to invite you to join us in that development as we have collaborated with Sling Health um, and developed the clinical problem database. The goal of that database is to get clinicians, med students, young physicians, those have just who have just entered clinical practice to identify problems that they see so that the innovators that are a part of our community can begin working on them with you. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Audit, but just to remind you, we will be sending an invitation to you all to join us on the Clinical Problem Database on PIN. Thanks. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, my name is Audit Shah. I'm a student at the University of Cambridge, and I serve as the National Network President of Sling Health a student-run biotechnology incubator that was founded in 2013 with two goals, one being to solve today's clinical problems and two, to train tomorrow's medical innovators in that process. And to that extent, our program has grown to about 15 institutions and supports about a nine-month program that supports students um, at any stage of their academic career, from first semester freshmen to resident physicians in training, and provides them with the capital, resources, mentorship they need to really actualize their ideas and develop innovations they believe will change patient care. And in that light, we've been collaborating with the American Medical Association and Matter to hold this workshop, um, the series of workshops to really help with healthcare innovation. And also, you know, as Amanda had said, launch the clinical problem database, which is really all about, you know, how do we facilitate conversations between students with this amazing wealth of technical expertise, like all of you today, and the physicians that are, you know, on the front lines that are really identifying those problems. So we really hope this tool will serve as a conversation starter for your adventures in healthcare innovation. Um, and, and with that being said, I want to return back to the topic of today's talk, design thinking in healthcare, thinking about how to solve these really complex problems with all the different stakeholders that are involved in medicine. And I can't think of anyone better to help us in that process than our key speakers today. 
Um, and our two speakers are, are Dr. Enid Montague from DePaul University, and she serves in their College of Computing, um, really studying and, and looking at human-computer interaction. And on the industry side, we have Jared Lowry, who's a business designer at Duke Tank in Chicago. And there he works to work with healthcare teams to accelerate innovation and really strategize about all the different players that are necessary to help bring uh, technology to market. And so with that, I'm really excited to hear what they have to share with us today, and I'll hand it over to them. Great. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. So I'm going to uh, share my slides. So today we're going to be talking about design thinking in healthcare. And um, I'm Enid Montague. Hi. And uh, Jarrett Lowry and I are going to tag team and go back and forth. So what is design thinking? You've probably heard of design thinking by now. Um, it's been coming, it's becoming more and more popular. So I think most of the major news periodicals have published design thinking as this great new innovative process for designing um, anything. So design thinking is a process for creative problem solving. And I love the idea of calling it problem solving because that's basically what we're doing. We're trying to figure out what is this problem in the world and how can we solve that most effectively using a design process. It encourages organizations to focus on the people, which makes it human centered. And that leads to better products, services and internal processes, meaning that people will be able to use whatever it is that you develop more efficiently, effectively, um, and they'll also find it more useful if you up top the, adopt this process. And design thinking is human-centered at its core. And so it means that we're thinking about humans and their design needs from a variety of different perspectives, and it holds that along throughout the design process. So in addition to all of these, design thinking is based in some other standards, like the human-centered design process, which is an international standard for designing things for humans. And so basically, if you're designing any sort of government project product or any product for humans, you should be using a design approach that puts humans at the core to make sure that you're making it safe and usable. So why would you want to use design thinking? So it aims to solve concrete human needs. And so instead of just saying, I, I think I know what people want, or I have a great idea, or this is what my cousin likes, um, you're really finding a way of using a rigorous process of extracting those human needs through observation, interview, quantitative design, and evaluation to make sure you're getting the, it right throughout the design process. It helps you tackle problems that are ambiguous or difficult to define sometimes. So, you know, I've done um, design thinking for healthcare for products ranging from how to make sure we don't lose organs in transplant. Um, so mapping out that process and thinking about the human needs um, to thinking about how do we engage emergency medicine physicians and patient-centered care and team-based care. So these are really tricky problems. Another project was um, how to help nurses develop trust and smart infusion monitors. Um, and so trying to figure out how to tackle something that's ambiguous or difficult to define can, be, can really lead to design solutions that might not be that effective. And so this helps you think about those things and to have a rigorous process to making sure you're doing it in the right way. It leads to more innovative solutions. So this is why a lot of popular press has been picking it up because companies that have been doing really well and been really innovative and ahead of the curve have been using these kinds of approaches. This is even more important in healthcare where not only do you want to be innovative, you wanna be responsive to a variety of different needs, but you also wanna make sure whatever you're doing is safe and not going to lead to any harm for healthcare workers and for patients. And finally, design thinking makes organizations more efficient. It's a very efficient process for solving these problems. And what's inefficient is if you think you know what the right answer is and you design something that's you know, just your great idea and you get it wrong. Um, you're talking about millions of dollars that you've gone down the wrong path and you try to develop something and you implement it and you find out that you're actually doing something that's potentially harmful and you can't implement it or you've designed something wrong and nobody wants to use it and then you have to start all over. And so the design thinking process helps to make the process much more condensed and concise so that you're going along the right way, but then also leading to the better end results in the end. So that's why we should use design thinking. What is it? So design thinking is what we call an iterative design process. There are five stages. So we start with empathy, where we're trying to understand what our user needs, trying to understand the problem. And we usually use a lot of qualitative methods here. 
um, things like interviews, observations, um, understanding what is the problem before we even start to think about what we're going to design. So you don't start design thinking saying, I have this great idea, this is what I'm going to build. We start by understanding what is the system that we're trying to design for, who are the people that work there, and what do they actually need. Then we start to define. Um, and then from define, we may do things like personas, challenges and pain points. And then we move to ideate where we finally start to think about what are our design solutions. And then we start to build those through prototype and then we test them to decide what works and what doesn't work. So what makes this an iterative process is I have this really nice circle, but it means that we may develop empathy here and then we may define it, but it may take us a few rounds before we know that we, we've got it right enough to move on. So you may circle around here, you may circle around here a lot. This is where we see a lot of um, iteration where you build lots of prototypes and you continue to test until you get it right. You're not just building one prototype and moving on to the other. And then you go around the circle as many times as you need to, to make sure that you're designing something properly. So I'm going to go through each of these steps in the design thinking process to give you a little bit more information. And then Jared is going to give you a concrete example about how they've used it. So empathy. So this is where you're researching your users' needs. It's really important to get an empathetic understanding of the problem that you're trying to solve. So we do things like conducting user research, and this is where we use a lot of methods where we go out into the field, we try to understand people's experiences, we use interviews, we use observations. Sometimes we even role play to see what it's like to be someone in that situation. And the importance of empathy is that it lets you set aside your own assumptions about the world and gain insights into the users and their needs. And this is why I really like this program because oftentimes designers will say they'll think they understand what it's like to be a physician and it's really hard to just understand that without talking to physicians engaging with physicians and developing a really good understanding without any assumptions from the media or you know your own limited perspective to make sure you really understand what their needs are and how you can turn that into design so jared Yes, uh, thank you, Enid. Um, as she said, I'll be sharing a handful of examples over the course of our presentation here, one per phase, um, and a couple things to know up front. We've got photos of in-person interactions. People are uh, maskless and not socially distanced. Obviously, these are from previous years. Uh, we could do screenshots of what we have been um, working with in the past five months, but those would be less exciting to look at. So if you're curious about how it looks uh, virtually, then um, I would encourage you to attend one of our do tank webinars in, in future weeks um, or just check out the the popular digital whiteboard tools like mural and miro uh, mural.co is a great place to start if you're looking for a digital whiteboard uh, with that said here here we go uh, with in-person examples from the past three years um, so with a health system a major health system who was a client of ours we did some patient understanding uh, using the value proposition canvas and an, an interesting element of this interaction, apart from using the visual tool that I'll talk about in a moment, uh, was that this organization actually did some research and put together packets, uh, which you can see people had printed out on top of their canvas, um, on five different types of customer they were serving. So there was Sam, the 28-year-old who's been um, in and out of stable housing, right? And there, there was you know, Lydia, the 65-year-old who has a couple of chronic conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those were really great things to bring to this, uh, to ground their participants in empathy and understanding, because it can be a little easy to kind of, you know, fly along with assumptions um, and be too, too vague or, or not rooted. So they did a great job with that. Uh, and the tool they used on our next slide was the uh, value proposition canvas. I'm showing it alongside another one for a reason you'll see in a moment. Uh, so in this canvas, we start with the right hand side and we're very customer centered. We think about uh, a person's straightforward jobs to be done, the pains they experience uh, in daily life, and the gains uh, that they strive and hope and dream for. And then on the left, we move over to talk about specific products and services that could be of use to them, uh, specifically with reference to what pains we can help them relieve and gains we can help them create. So it's a nice sort of two-sided uh, canvas that starts with empathy, but then moves to uh, notions about product design. Uh, and I show it alongside the empathy map, uh, which was created by Dave Gray, uh, a peer of ours in the industry, because that's just a deeper dive on, um, and, and another way of looking at the right-hand side of this value proposition. They're not one-to-one, -one, uh, but they both really involve empathizing. So you, you go around and talk about who and what uh, you are empathizing with, and then 
you, you literally think through some of their senses, right? What do they see, say, think, feel, hear, and do. Um, and, and we like that exercise a lot because that's, it's just a great way to organize your thinking about what this person's actual experience is like. Again, there will be assumptions sometimes to the extent you can get past those, it's preferable. Uh, but those are two excellent tools for this phase. And you'll note in the bottom right, um, many of these tools can be found on our uh, Business Design Academy at Dutank. Uh, in a couple of cases, it'll be discoverable elsewhere. So take a look at the bottom right uh, as I share these tools going forward. So that's my example for uh, the empathize phase. Great, that was perfect, thank you. So after that, we start to think about how are we going to define these user needs? And oftentimes, um, we have this vision of the designer who is just this you know, creative person who is just generating lots of ideas, but really it's very systematic. So we wanna clearly state user needs and problems and start to develop requirements for this. So we're gonna analyze these observations and we're gonna synthesize them into core problems that we've identified. And we're gonna have definitions that maybe call problem statements that can help lead into um, specific design needs. And so we may create things like personas like that Jared mentioned um, to help keep our efforts human centered before proceeding to ideation. And personas are just ways of representing some of the key characteristics that we have from the users that we've observed and interviewed um, to keep those in mind throughout the design process. I'm an industrial engineer by training. And so a lot of the methods that we also use during this stage, if we're looking for something that's like a really complex problem, we might do things like um, failure analysis, where we're mapping out the process of doing something that we think may have errors um, and capturing the task. And then looking at some of those pain points where potential errors can occur, identifying challenges. But then more importantly, we're also looking for opportunities. So there may be things that are in this process that we hadn't thought of that would be a great opportunity for innovating. And this is where we see a lot of the innovation come out of the human centered or the um, design thinking process. Um, we're really starting to identify things that we hadn't thought of before. You all may be all familiar with things like root cause. When we're doing this definition and mapping out some of the needs and the problems from the data that we've collected, we're also starting to look at what is the root cause of that problem. So why don't people trust this infusion pump? Um, what is wrong with the way that we've introduced them, that they've, the ones that they have before, or the interface or design? What is the root cause of that particular challenge? And then that can help us start to think about how we can actually um, design beyond that. And so I'll move forward to the next slide with Jared. Thank you. Um, yeah, so in this define phase, uh, which you know often follows and sort of uh, intermixes with the empathize phase, because obviously, there's, there's you know, iteration and circling back. Um, something that we like to help people do is identify challenges, and as Ina noted, very importantly, opportunities. Um, so a couple of years ago, we worked with a group of pediatricians. Um, some of you, you know, as, as med students on uh, this call may become pediatricians or, or specialize in another field. Um, but we brought in, on behalf of a, a hospital, we brought in physicians themselves, not just administrators, not just kind of strategy or innovation folks as important as they are. Um, and we said, let's identify some challenges. We used a very simple tool uh, called the sailboat canvas and printed on, on their table uh, two years ago was a sort of earlier version of what you're about to see. So I'll, I'll show you the tool so you can actually understand it on the next slide. Um, and with the sailboat canvas, what we like to do is have people identify um, what they are what they're looking at in terms of the, the thing that is propelled forward or held back, right? Is the boat representing their organization? Is it representing a particular project? Uh, you can even do it on yourself as an individual. How is my you know, uh, job or career going at the moment? Uh, that sort of thing. But the, the two key elements uh, beyond defining and, and or naming the boat are enablers and blockers. So a very simple uh, sort of wind in your sails and uh, waves pulling you back metaphor. Uh, the enablers are about what's pushing you forward, the positive forces that you might want to amplify or leverage, uh, and then the blockers with the anchor there uh, are the things that hold you back, the obstacles that stand in your way. And so this is a radically simple tool. You know, it's got two kind of three parts to it with the boat itself, um, but it's a great place to start a team off in order to uh, define opportunities and identify challenges. Uh, you can get more complex with it, right, by color coding and saying, okay, maybe all of our initial ideas are in yellow, but then the big enablers will, will turn green and the big blockers are red. 
uh, and move to a subsequent phase with those top ideas in mind. Lots you can do with it to get more complex, uh, but there's really nothing wrong at that stage uh, with starting on a very simple tool like the sailboat. That's great. I love this sailboat. It just looks <laughs> like it's fun to use also. And I think, you know, I've never actually used that particular canvas, but this is a really good time to mention that if you're interested in using design thinking, when you work with people like Jared and I, we often have lots and lots of tools for each of these stages, And that's usually what we bring to the table as um, UX researchers, human computer action people, or human factors engineer, is that we can also think of the best tool to help you through this particular stage. And so from there, we start to think about ideating. And this is, this is what most people think design thinking is, is that you're coming up with these great ideas. And even here, there's a lot of structure to how we actually do this. Um, so we're gonna start generating ideas. We use a variety of different um, techniques to help people brainstorm. We really curate who's at the table when we're brainstorming. Sometimes it's just the designers and the design team. Sometimes it's more participatory, where we're bringing in people from different organizations. And we also have some techniques where we really try to help people think outside of the box when they're brainstorming. So the idea is to generate as many ideas as possible and to start thinking of different ways to solve this problem, different ways to view this problem, to come up with these innovative solutions. And so here, you know, it's not just that we're going to say, we have it, we have this one idea and that's it. We're going to come up with like a hundred different ideas and then we're going to organize those to help us think of, um, what are the ones that are the priorities? And so the idea is to come up with lots and lots of ideas and sort of to stretch your, your mental creative um, energies um, with all of the information that you had before. So it's informed brainstorming. When we're challenging assumptions, we're building, we're letting really um, extreme creative solutions be brought to the table because that helps us develop more innovative ideas. All ideas are going to be worthy here and then we'll start to think about how we're going to prioritize those to think of how we might use some of these ideas to something that's more concrete. Well said Enid and um, yeah I particularly like this phase and talking about it in uh, the design thinking context because it's actually the one that people are most often familiar with uh, prior to experiencing design thinking. You know basically everybody has been in some kind of meeting where there's been a brainstorm right everybody write down on your notepad, grab your post-it notes, whatever it might be. But the tricky part, I think, is coming into it with better information, as she alluded to, you know, what should be those preceding steps like empathize and define, and then knowing kind of what to do with it, right, or, or how best within this phase to prioritize ideas. So the example I'm about to share has three parts, uh, and hopefully uh, this will make it a little clearer and, and more concrete. So naturally, we start with um, individual ideation. So we were working with a nonprofit uh, oversight group that has, has a publication and some influence uh, in, in this realm as well as over some other industries. Um, and we started with prompting and sort of provocative questions. We went through a series of slides and said, you know, one by one, what would you do if this? What, what would you do if you tried to triple your revenue? What would you do if you tried to 10X your audience, right? You know, radical kind of mind bending um, prompting questions. Everybody came up with their handful of ideas. You can see them in front of a few people here and then shared those around the group, uh, you know, their top two or three ideas. In the second step, they started to post them on the wall. So there were several teams uh, in the room and, and this guy here is posting one of his ideas on the wall. Uh, so obviously quite a collection. Uh, this was midway through one of three teams posting their ideas. So there were something like a hundred ideas generated in that room in maybe a 10 minute span. Uh, so they posted everybody everybody's ideas on a wall, nice and simple. And then in the third piece, that's where we get a little more rigorous. And we said, okay, let's plot these on an XY matrix. Um, let's talk about the feasibility of each idea and the potential impact. Um, and so you, you see to the right there, uh, part of an innovation wall where basically the, um, the, the draw pile was placed. And then the top ideas floated over to this uh, left-hand canvas and, and this is a hand-drawn one. It's such a simple tool that we never bother to print it up, right? It's an X and Y axis. Um, but the key is in really getting folks to think about what's the X position of this idea? Just how feasible is it? In, in whatever terms you want to use to define it, resources required, time, size of team. Um, and once we've figured out the X, move up and down on the Y, uh, the impact. You know, and, and again, that's defined in your own organization's terms. Um, 
revenue brought in, you know, patients affected, um, culture change based on minds changed in, um, in the organization. If you make sure to do those kind of one and then the other, you'll avoid the accidental straight line, which happens where people just, however much I, they like it, is how far toward the top right it goes. So X then Y. Um, and the tool there on, our, on my final slide in this section is um, this simple. We, we have made it, you know, sort of a print format, but uh, not very often. So I suggest uh, drawing it yourself in a digital whiteboard like Mural or Miro. Um, even doing it in a PowerPoint works and is, is nice and simple if you uh, don't sign up for one of those web-based tools. And where we're relevant these days, uh, a whiteboard is a great place to jot that down as well as a flip chart. So a nice, simple tool, but a really great one for adding rigor to that uh, ideation phase. That's fantastic. There's a real art and science to kind of coming through all of these ideas to something that not only that everyone in the room feels confident that we're on the right track. Um, so the sort of leadership of the design process, if you've ever done any kind of art critique, you know, it, it's hard to tell people like, well, this isn't the idea that we're going with. So you want everyone moving forward. So these tools are really great at helping people understand why we're moving forward and to get buy in um, at the designs that you may come up with. And so here we're finally at prototyping. So then we're starting to actually build things. And prototyping is um, a very, very iterative process. Oftentimes people think that when you're doing prototyping, you're building this kind of one very expensive device that's going to do half of the things that you wanted to do. And we actually, when we do prototyping, it's really part of a creative experimental process. And so the aim here is to design possible solutions for each of the problems. And we're going to start with really inexpensive scale down versions of the product. Like we often start with things like paper prototypes where we're, you know, just kind of sketching things out and maybe um, seeing how people can interact with them, seeing if the information makes sense. And then if we get that right, we'll move on to a different prototype. For each of these, usually um, when I'm going through this process, we may have you know, eight to 10 different prototypes. And each time we develop a prototype, we're evaluating it in some way. So we may have things like mock-ups um, that are just kind of ideas. We may have storyboards where we're kind of looking at the concepts. So what would the world look like if you had, you know, this, this smart watch that could give you um, information about your patients? We'll start with some low fidelity prototypes. And even with low fidelity prototypes, we're able to get some feedback from people about how they use and have them interact with them. And then we may move to even higher fidelity prototypes um, that look closer to what the design that we're looking for. In a clinical context, so the project I meant was, uh, mentioned with transplant, we're even having to look at like the experience of using something in a complex organization. So your prototypes may scale up to full environments with actual people um, simulating what it would be like to use your tool um, in this particular context. And so prototypes are meant to be thrown away. So we're learning as we're developing these prototypes. We're not necessarily prototyping what's going to be our final idea. We're learning as we move forward. Sorry about that, had myself on mute. Uh, in this example, as we started to prototype um, with a team from a, a children's hospital, um, we did a paper prototype and we used a, an early version of the tool you're about to see, the idea flip. Um, so this was a situation where we had five teams, uh, each focused on a different aspect of a patient experience. There were people talking about, um, you know, the visits from doctors uh, when, they, when they go around and, and what do those visits need to look like. The group uh, you see here in this photo was um, concerned with tech and treatment. What kinds of tech solutions could they bring to bear to better serve the patient group uh, that they were talking about? Uh, the person with the marker there is starting to sketch kind of a smartphone and this team was thinking about uh, an app that could help uh, patients and their parents track the course of care. Um, a quick note, by the way, you know, th all these examples are from different organizations uh, that were each doing a phase. Obviously, in almost every case, they went through all the phases. Uh, so this team did not merely prototype, but of course they started with, with uh, prior stages like ideation and um, emp empathy. But um, yeah, just wanted to note that so that it doesn't seem too disconnected from the overall process. And then I'll show you the tool itself, the idea flip. Uh, so this is what it looks like now. We've gotten a little more, uh, a little more symbolic with it. It's a bit of a, a light bulb. Um, and here we ask folks to define the problem that they have probably identified or defined in a previous phase, uh, sketch out their big idea, 
And this is where it's essentially a paper, paper prototype. You know, show us that uh, potential user interface of a smartphone app. Show us the features of the medical device you would be de designing. Um, and if it's something a little more interpersonal, you know, talk to us about the phases of a different kind of interaction you want to create. Uh, you know, a, a different way of going around to patients over the course of your day in a hospital. Um, two pieces that I'll highlight here with a little pop out are impact and size of prize. Um, so these are really interesting ones to talk through when you're prototyping because the patient's perspective matters very much, but so does kind of your organization's perspective and that of the wider world. And so here we call out impact. Um, in, in other words, the positive effects that this will have for your customer um, and the world as a whole. And then size of prize, which is kind of the internal uh, return on investment, the thing that'll help you sell this to colleagues who may be you know, very financially minded and, and worried that this will uh, deliver a return. So those are two to call out uh, on this five part tool. And then lastly, assumptions and risks are great to think through um, to ensure that, uh, that you have covered your bases and that you know what you want to test, sort of the basis on which you wanna test this prototype. So while, while we've left it for last on this tool, it's a crucial one because um, that's where you're really gonna observe the collision with reality uh, that, this, that this prototype undergoes. That's where you're gonna ask the key pointed questions in this test phase uh, to ensure that you're learning exactly what you want to and you're getting the feedback that'll move you forward. Great. So after we have our prototypes, then we actually start to test these solutions. And this is where you have um, evaluators, maybe they're end users, maybe they're experts um, who are evaluating who rigorously test the prototypes. Um, this is my expertise. So my expertise is in usability evaluation. And so oftentimes when people think usability evaluation, they think everything's done and then you're evaluating it. You actually are going to be evaluating it throughout. Um, even though this is the final stage of design thinking, you're going to kind of go back and forth through those cycles of prototyping, testing, and evaluations um, to make sure you're getting everything from the way the information is conveyed, the way that um, you interact with the tool, the way it's integrated into um, any particular context right, because it's really important that it's usable for all of those different levels and that it's useful for the participants that you are designing for. So oftentimes teams will use the result, results of a test to refine um, or find more problems to move forward. So we may start off with this iterative usability testing where we're um, developing low fidelity prototypes um, and testing them and learning as we go. But then further along, we have a pretty clear idea of what it is that we're developing. Then we start thinking about making sure that whatever we're developing is um, evaluated rigorously enough to ensure that it's going to be um, usable and safe enough to move to market and to be used by humans. Um, and so that's when we have a more um, uh, quantitative lab-based controlled setting where we're evaluating um, different tools to make sure that it's, it's really going to not do any harm and to be usable by users um, when we send it out into the world. We also may do some testing where we're looking at how well whatever we develop um, is going to fit within a particular context. This is pretty important if you're developing anything that someone's going to use in a complex environment where they may be under different kinds of pressures like time pressures or stress or working with lots of different people that you may want to either simulate that environment, um, which we've done in some simulation labs, like we've simulated, you know, um, operating um, rooms, uh, we've simulated um, uh, care spaces where different users kind of interact, or you may try something that involves some kind of in situ testing where you're actually testing it in an environment where people are actually using it. But there's lots of different ways that you can evaluate. The important thing is that you continuously evaluating and the, um, the design process is really grounded in this idea of evaluating to continue to learn throughout the process. Totally agree. And I would just add before sharing my example that um, a great thing to do too is just to, to let people know that you're testing it and, and flag that, hey, this is the beta version. You know, we invite you to test this out before it's you know, fully uh, ready for prime time. I think one, people are sort of honored to be included in that if they're say a power user of your app or you always see them at your store and, and that's, um, that's why you choose them to test it out, right? And two, it, um, it gives you the freedom and the space to be imperfect and to show something as soon as it's semi-ready uh, before waiting for that perfection that can take uh, a lot of time and a lot of resources to arrive at. Um, 
so yeah, just simple as letting people know, hey, this is you know the beta and we're testing it out. Um, so the example I've got here is not quite as exciting as the lab setting that Ian had talked about. Uh, I personally don't have a photo uh, of that kind of environment, um, but this was a very cool one. We ran an innovation challenge and unlike a lot of the clients uh, that we've had photos of here, we can tell you the name of this one. Uh, so we worked with the Illinois Health and Hospital Association or IHA uh, to run an innovation uh, challenge actually at Matter. So you might even recognize this room, some folks on this call um, in late 2017 and it continued into 2018. Um, and what we were doing was sourcing innovations from different hospitals around the state of Illinois that could be uh, one kind of awarded and recognized, but most importantly, uh, spread to other sites. And part of the, the decision process was having them go before a panel of judges who sort of acted as the, uh, the test audience and evaluated. Uh, so they used a tool that I'll show you on the following page called the test card. Um, and this is developed by, again, some peers of ours in the industry. So you've seen some uh, do tank original tools like the idea flip. This is from Strategizer, uh, another firm that we admire in this space. Um, and on the test card, unlike the, a lot of these tools, it's not printed up big for a team to use uh, collectively, but it is uh, more letter sized. And individually, you, you sort of think through, what is the hypothesis I'm seeing here? Um, what is the test that will need to be applied? How will we measure uh, that this is either you know, a success or a failure by the terms of this test? And we'll know we're right if X, Y, Z happens. Uh, and you know, some other little tools around here, you can indicate criticality, cost of the test, uh, time required, et cetera. So that, um, as I've, I've learned over the course of uh, consuming strategizers resources, is a tool they developed to just get more rigorous about testing themselves. And we found it to be great as well. So um, you'll notice in the bottom right, unlike most of these tools that can be found at academy.dotankdo.com slash tools, this is on their website. So assets.strategizer.com, uh, assets, resources, the test card. That is my uh, fifth and final example of a design thinking tool. Great, so that's, that's the design thinking process. And we thought that right now, it would be really great um, to think about how we might apply design thinking to a COVID-19 challenge. And um, one of the challenge that we thought of was how can we reduce viral spread in highly crowded areas like public transportation. So Jared and I, we're just gonna talk about how we might use um, this process to chat to um, address this particular challenge. So this is a big problem, um, a current problem right now. People want to go back to taking public transportation. And so how can we make sure we're reducing the viral spread in these areas? And so this is our process. And this one is a little bit different because it's got these lines to sort of illustrate how we might iterate. So we would start off with empathy. And so one thing that we might do in empathy is that we might start off with interviewing people who have expertise in this space, some of the end users, um, and doing some observations. When we say interview, we might wanna really think about who are the stakeholders here? Who are the kinds of people that we might wanna interview? So I would probably wanna use um, interview people that use tra public transportation, but I'd also wanna make sure that I'm really diverse-minded about that. So for example, um, I have two small kids, and so I travel with a double stroller. Um, it's a very different experience for people who are using wheelchairs or strollers or other aids who use public transportation in terms of the things that they touch. And so I'd want to make sure that I'm targeting those people and also people that have different ages and behaviors, um, people who use public transportation every day versus people that may not use public transportation every day. And I'd just like to, to pause on that and note you know, that right there makes this different than I think the typical or instinctual approach, right? I think a lot of people, if you just read a news piece about this, will go, public transportation, COVID-19, uh, cleaning. We need more cleaning. That's it. Maybe. That's probably a big part of it. But, you know, just thinking about people who use a wheelchair or a stroller instantly makes it so much more specific and, and sort of definable uh, to understand who might need, you know, more uh, interventions or... or uh, elements of a solution for their needs. So some other things that we also might do here that you don't see in some other design processes that we might go beyond public transportation. We might say, what are places where they have really good infection control and what are they doing? And let's observe some of those things as well to kind of build that knowledge base of um, what are what things we could observe and interview as we move forward. So those are some examples of things that we might do to develop empathy um, for this particular problem. There, and there's many others that you could think through. 
So then after that, we would go to um, defining. And this is where we're starting to map the findings from observations and interviews. We might spend you know, many days observing everybody that goes on to this, a CTA train or a bus um, to identify things. And then we have to combine all of this in some way to be able to identify challenges and opportunities. And this is a great tool, by the way, this experience map. Obviously, we're not showing it uh, to the, the level of resolution that you can really uh, see the pieces and parts. But I'll just make the point that um, the, the example I showed, the sailboat, is nice and simple. But a, an experience map or a journey map is an excellent uh, tool at the define phase as well. It's about understanding, you know, what are those stages of the experience that somebody goes through and really think broadly and holistically, right? It's not just get on the bus, sit on the bus, exit the bus. It's how do they, you know, find it in terms of timing? Uh, you know, what is what is a person done or not done with their own masks uh, over the course of their day? You know, what do they do um, in places with good contact tracing after having been in a public setting? So an experience map is an amazing um, tool for for rigorously approaching the de defined phase. You can see in this experience map too, so we often use different colors like green or red and we say this was a great part of this experience. Like when you know you get a seat and um, it's a seat that you want, a poor part maybe you're, you're squished in front of two people um, or something like that and we would map these things because these are the pain points and these are the opportunities um, for design and these are also the challenges for humans. So then after this, we're going to be brainstorming. And this is where we start to think about new ways of using public transportation. And this brainstorming can, can happen in a lot of different ways. If I were to do this, I would really probably take a more participatory brainstorming session. So I wouldn't have um, just a team of designers work on this. I would probably involve some, um, some public health people as well, some people who understand um, some of the constraints, some end users, some people who are really familiar with public transportation, in addition to some people who are um, just really great innovative um, designers who are really good at brainstorming, and then somebody who's really good at facilitating this. Absolutely, nothing to add on that face. <laughs> So then we would start to think about how we would design solutions based on this brainstorm. So we're going to have, you know, hopefully a hundred different great ideas. Um, and we'll start to do something like what Jared showed where we're kind of mapping these out and sort of prioritizing them based on what we think is the most important. Um, and so some of the things that we might start to uh, design might be some really low fidelity solutions. This has nothing to do with public transportation, or maybe it does. We don't know what we're going to design here. Um, but maybe we're just kind of looking at what it might be like to interact with something that's like a wearable solution that gives you like a score of the number of people and how potentially safe this one bus is and helps you make decisions about which buses you take um, to something that might be a much more high fidelity solution. So if this on the um, on the right, you may have seen this before. So this is a driving simulator. This is really um, common for people who do like distracted driving research. You may want to simulate what it's like for the person driving the public transportation in a real environment. So it's not it's not safe to have them use a new tool while they're actually driving a bus full of people. But you can simulate this to make sure that when you're evaluating, you're evaluating it for things that are important for that particular particular user. We've seen some interesting things uh, in the world with the prototype phase, uh, specifically with COVID-19 and public transport this year. And it's, it's been impressive to see what cities have done around um, helping people get where they're going outside of buses and trains. Uh, so the city of Chicago has seen an expansion of uh, lift shareable bike access, including some e-bikes that allow people to go farther with the same effort. And that can be huge if you're trying to avoid the bus entirely. Um, and the city of Paris, uh, famously in the last month has built 400 miles of bike lanes, which is you know, an insane amount for a city to accomplish that fast. And they've done it out of necessity. People have been you know, in larger numbers than usual, afraid to use the Metro. And so they have essentially prototyped a more bike heavy future. Um, and they've given themselves the ability to go back to more car, bus and train heavy uh, when, when necessary, but uh, they've essentially taken a prototyping approach. Yeah, and I think that that's fantastic because it really, you know, you think you're solving a problem. You think we're going to redesign a bus or transit, but if you take this approach, you may really be thinking of a different solution for that problem. Um, and in Chicago, we've done lots of like slow streets to encourage more people um, to bike um, and to walk in, um, in wider spaces. 
And so then we're going to start testing these. And so you test your early prototypes. Um, you're going to test them for a variety of different things, depending on what the solution is that you're looking for. Um, you may start testing, like if it's something about um, picking the right bus to make sure that you're picking the least crowded bus, you're going to, to test it to make sure that people can understand which bus is the least crowded bus based on some really simple icons and information. Can they log into the system very easily? Does it work with all the other apps that they're using? Can they use it if they don't have any free hands? Um, can they make the right decisions from it? And then we're going to continue to prototype um, and test um, to make sure we're getting the right design to the final stages. And then when we're closer to the end, that's when we're going to do um, a larger, more rigorous um, evaluation of those prototypes so that we're, make, we're very clear before we invest millions of dollars into redesigning something that we've designed the right thing and we designed it in the right way. Once again, too, too good on the uh, self-muting. Uh, yeah, the test phase is, is so important here. And it's right that, uh, you know, getting those in the hands of people, wh whatever it is that you've developed to, to give their feedback and, and be frank with you is huge. You know, seeing how it works for yourself, knowing all of the quirks you've built into it uh, is not nearly as good as getting it in the hands of somebody who would be using it for the first time um, and having a, a unique experience with the products, needing it to work right for them. That's such a good point. You're never designing for yourself. You're always designing for lots of other people. And then finally, after this, then you're, you're getting ready to implement into the real world. So you've gone through the entire design thinking process, and then you're starting to think about how is this going to work? How do we get this into the right hands? So that's, um, I know we've kind of gone over a little bit time that we wanted to. So we have some time for questions now. If you have questions about the process we've described or um, if you want information about how you find professionals to work with to do this, um, we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you guys so much. Um, that was really insightful. Uh, so just to jump to some of our questions that we've received, um, what are some of the techniques for building consensus amongst participants during the brainstorming phase and how do you promote uh, confident buy-in? I can take that one. Um, so one thing we love to do, and uh, I'll talk about the in-person and remote versions. So in-person first um, is, get those ideas up on a wall and ask people, okay, cluster these, cluster like with like, maybe you're looking at 20 ideas and we know we wanna boil it down to two or three to pursue. Well, are there any kind of duplicate ideas among the 20? Are there any that are on basically the same theme? Start by clustering those um, on your flip chart or whiteboard, put some circles around the clusters. So we realize, okay, the 20 ideas are, you know, 12 unique ideas and then three more clusters of ideas, great. Um, give everybody some time to look at them distribute kind of sticky dots and say, now everybody take three of these and, and indicate you know, your favorite three uh, that you think are worth pursuing. You'll get kind of a heat map, right? It'll, it'll look like you know, uh, ants attacking a melted popsicle or something. And you'll go, oh wow, that's where the areas of interest are, great. And then you can get more defined from there and say, let's take a formal vote. You know, or if there's a deadlock, you'll have your own organization's decision-making like, hey, sometimes a VP just needs to make the call. Um, but those definitely help get to that phase uh, with greater consensus before somebody maybe individually has to make it for the group. Yeah, I think everything that Jared, the, the power of just kind of having things mapped out on a wall. So when you see these design thinking sessions, you'll see like lots of PowerPoints like all around a wall, um, I think also helps people um, rethink their own ideas. And we're not taking each idea, we're kind of sometimes deconstructing. So the final idea may be some combination of a many, many different ideas along the way, but helping, being a good facilitator, helping people be heard, letting everybody put something up on the wall, I think helps a lot. And then getting buy-in is also about, you know, showing the rigor of the process, showing that you're solving this problem that has led to, you know, errors or challenge or cost problems. I think that um, being able to show that we didn't just, you know, wake up in the middle of the night and say, we have this great idea that we actually brought in people with all these expertise. We have all of these different ideas. These are all of our findings. And we've structured into this particular solution really helps to develop buy-in from a lot of people. I don't think I've ever had a session where somebody um, has walked out angry, feeling like they, you know, they, we didn't choose their idea. Cause I think that because of the process, people often say, you know what, this is, the right idea. It's not about me being right, it's about getting it right. 
Absolutely. I would echo that. And, and I forgot uh, to say the remote version of that. So, so on a tool like Mural, uh, there are remote voting tools and it's, it's very simple to use as a facilitator on Mural uh, to sort of say start voting session, give people those virtual sticky dots and have them then uh, vote on their favorite ideas. And if you want to get even simpler than that, just draw little circles and say, hey, everybody has five circles, go drag them where you like. So that's the remote approach. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, another question came in around prototyping. So how does a team most effectively choose the best two to three, two to three ideas to turn into prototypes? So that's a really tough question, I think, because um, you're not always prototyping the entire idea. Um, so for example, like if I want to build something that helps people um, you know, figure out when they should take their medication. There are 10 different ways to portray time past. Which one is going to be the right way to portray time past for this particular user? Maybe it's older people that take eight different medications. And so what I may prototype is four or five of those ways um, that I think will work. And I may do a test to see which one has the, the least amount of errors and is the most understandable about from my target demographic. Um, and then that information will lead to um, give us more information towards the final design. And so when we talk about prototyping, it's not always one big package. It's sometimes lots of little pieces of that package together. Um, and you may have more, more to add about this, Jared. Yeah, that's a great point. I would definitely echo the fact that it's, uh, it's not always define, designing the whole solution in, in one prototype. Uh, but there are pieces that you can test. Um, something we've seen with a, a health system we're working with this year where we are doing this all remotely, again, not many cool photos to show you, uh, but uh, some work with a health system is testing like the internal um, organizational story piece of a, of a project. So if you're um, working, for example, on um, telehealth and you know that you're going to need some serious buy-in from doctors who are not especially used to delivering care virtually. Um, a big piece of what you just want to prototype is um, when we send out the messages in our organization, hey, we're about to start using this app. And you know, between these hours on these days, certain docs are expected to use that and they'll deliver care virtually. Um, does that message you know, hit the ears right and, and you know, read right to people? Does it, uh, does it accomplish what it needs to? Or you know, on the other hand, does it create any uh, fear, confusion, et cetera. Um, so that's an example of, you know, really that's not the whole solution, right? But it is an important piece of it uh, that's worth prototyping on its own. And as far as, you know, choosing the two to three best, I would kind of go back to the, um, the ideation phase with the matrix and just say that there's really a lot to be said for thinking about um, both what would have a huge impact, and those are worth testing, as well as what's feasible and maybe quick um, because you might kind of, go a little bit in both directions with a couple of prototypes. What's, what's something uh, nice and easy to prototype and get out there in people's hands? And then what's, what's our, our dream product that we should keep working on in the background because that's going to be uh, useful too. In prototypes, if, you're, if you do have like an idea, that is a prototype. So oftentimes we'll use um, like scenarios um, or storyboards. So basically it's like a comic strip of um, what the world would look like with this tool. And we may have four or five different ideas that we send out to get ideas from different people. Like one of my students wanted to develop a, a smart mirror in their bathroom that um, told you, read your email to them. And so they developed this scenario and they sent it out. Nobody liked this idea. Um, but it evolved into something that actually ended up being like pretty great from getting that early feedback. And it took, you know, no money to develop that kind of prototype to get the feedback early. Wow, that sounds like a pretty awesome idea. Um, and the, on a related note, um, have you used computational modeling software to rapidly evaluate the performance of a product design? Hmm. So you mean like I analytics? Um, so um, yes and no. Uh, so I always think that, you know, when, when you're thinking about anything that's with data, you have to really understand what is the data that you're getting. And I think you, analytics can be really helpful along the process of a design process and also when something is actually implemented to give you some feedback, but it's never going to be the whole picture. And so it's something that needs to be added with um, 
actually interacting with humans and actually talking with humans. Because I think when you take um, a pure database computational modeling approach to human behavior, you often exclude a lot of different users that weren't thought of in that algorithm. And so it's really important to take those approaches. So if somebody says, I'm doing usability or design work for you, and I'm just taking a bunch of data from somewhere else, um, I would be really skeptical. Awesome. Um, how would you use design thinking for something less tangible, such as improving physician engagement? Great question. Um, so I think in many cases, the mere act of involving um, physicians in your design thinking process is huge for engaging them. I mean, we've seen it in, in hospitals in Chicagoland and elsewhere. Uh, when you bring a doctor who is, you know, used to uh, seeing patients, doing paperwork, uh, you know, worrying about the, the um, right in front of your nose day-to-day -day aspects of their job, and you invite them to, you know, take an hour or two on an afternoon uh, to think through uh, a, a bigger, grander challenge than maybe they are, are used to facing. Um, grander is probably the wrong word, obviously, if you're saving someone's life, that's quite grand. Uh, but um, a, 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 you know, innovative challenge, shall we say. Um, the, the sort of gratitude and the, the appreciation for being included is huge. So I'd say just including them uh, is great for engaging physicians. I mean, I would take it at, take the approach as it is because really understanding what the problem is, is going to lead to the solution. So I study um, primary care physicians quite a bit. And one of the things that I found was that um, the amount of time that they were spending, like entering information into certain EHRs or after hours charting was something that was probably time that they wanted to use doing some other things. And so when you start to map out these things and understand some of the pain points and the challenges, solving a smaller problem that's not necessarily engagement could lead to something like engagement. Um, but I would use it exactly as it is. I've used this approach for things like physician interactions with patients and also with patient engagement. And I've actually found it to be way more successful in those kinds of problems than when I say, um, we're going to develop an app to do this other thing, because it leads to like what Jared said, um, organizational change and buy-in. You know, people start thinking, oh, wow, we could do things differently. We're really excited about this. We could start using some of these techniques in our own meetings to think about how we might be able to do something different. And that kind of hope can be really inspiring to organizations. Absolutely. And I think we have time for just two more questions. Um, but one of the questions I wanted to ask is, how do you involve underserved communities um, in design thinking like focus groups during COVID-19 and what approval forms are used to engage uh, to engage people? So I can address at least the first part of that. Um, the, the notion of underserved communities and getting involved in this kind of uh, work, we've not done a ton of that, but where we have, it's been really in, inspiring and cool. Um, we've worked with uh, a group in a, in a Chicago neighborhood, Little Village, um, to bring together uh, small business people uh, through actually a, a sort of sister organization to Matter, 1871 not officially uh, affiliated, but you guys are, are alike in some ways. Uh, 1871 brought together a group of um, small business people from Little Village in Chicago to think through uh, their own immediate business challenges um, and through a design thinking approach. The other uh, case that's come to my mind is a health system in greater New York where uh, they were working on diversity and inclusion. And instead of just making that kind of an HR conversation, they actually brought people together from every single function uh, in the organization, literally from you know executives uh, to like maintenance staff, and the the insights they gleaned from including every single level of the organization. They just could not talk enough about how valuable it was to have all of those uh, perspectives represented, and and not just again kind of starting with one's own assumptions from say an administrative uh, role. So as far as approval forms, I am I am not sure. Um, what was done on kind of the back end or the client side uh, to ensure that that those people were uh, recruited properly. But once they were, uh, the sessions were extra valuable. I mean, I think that you include marginalized people in, in the process, just like you would in a regular process. I do a lot of work thinking about like anti-racist design approaches. I'll actually be giving a workshop um, at DC Design Week that's open to anybody that wants to take it in September. 
Um, and so one of the approaches that I often take is, um, Ma well, one, making sure you're including people, like making sure you have somewhat, you have some diversity, but also the approach of pinpointing who are the most marginalized users in that context and environment and directing your design efforts towards those groups of people. Um, and then maybe expanding beyond that. So for example, if I'm looking at um, patient engagement um, and pediatrics, I would wanna make sure I'm looking at the patients that have the, the most barriers, the, you know, the, the biggest challenges and really speaking to them about those versus um, taking, you know, thinking more, more statistically saying, well, I need 20 participants. I'll just take whatever 20 participants. I'll go out of my way to make sure that I'm including those people and making sure it's accessible for them to participate. Oftentimes doing things like Jared said, working with community-based organizations and then also adapting the methods so that it's not, you're kind of disrupting the power structures. You don't want to come in saying, I'm this designer with a PhD and I'm designing for you. Oftentimes, many groups have already come up with lots of solutions and you want to give them a way to empower the solutions and involve them in the, the process in a much more participatory way. And I find that when you do that, you come up with results that are um, much more empowering for communities, but also more likely to work because people are going to trust you and um, be honest with you in the process. And you're gonna find solutions, you're gonna find the right problem you're going to come to the root cause of those problems um, for organizations. And when you design for people in the margins, the design is way better for everybody else um, because you never really, when you think of the, the most marginalized users, you often identify problems that everybody has, but those users um, tend to be more affected by them. Well, and I know that we just a couple, well, we're two minutes over, so I'm just going to end on one more question and then I'll close that close out. Um, what is the best way to get involved with design and healthcare as a med student or future physician? I'll give one quick answer to that. Uh, and it may have an additional perspective. Um, I would say Matter runs events sometimes where they are recruiting people uh, to bring in their different perspectives, right? Hey, we need some participants from pharma and we need some doctors and we need some, you know, uh, patients and, and occasionally med students or future physicians. So I would say, you know, be on the lookout. Um, I would, I would guess that if you've attended this series of webinars, you are in a matter list or database where you might get called upon to add that perspective. So that's a great first step from my perspective, having helped, you know, run workshops like that where matter has uh, recruited participants just like you guys. Yeah, I think if you're in Chicago, you're, you know, you're in luck. There are so many cool opportunities where people are actively trying to engage med students, you know, so there are interdisciplinary med schools where people are trying to incorporate design thinking and working with design labs. There's many opportunities to work with um, researchers that are designing things, um, attend workshops that matter. Um, all throughout the year, if that's what interests you. You can also consider things like MD, PhDs, where you may double major in a design um, uh, field. So I've, I've um, mentored students who are pursuing their medical degree, but also um, a degree in like human computer interaction or experience design or human factors um, and patient safety. And I think that um, those experiences may take a little bit more time, but it may be more rewarding if you're building your team of people and developing that expertise. But you also can do a lot of these design fellows. There's some design fellowships um, after medical school that you may also be interested in. It's a really exciting time to be doing design work as a physician and I'm really thankful for programs like this to create more opportunities. Well, great, thank totally you so agreed. much. Um, on that note, I know we didn't get to everyone's questions, but if you wanna shoot me an email with your question, I can see if I can get those answered. Um, I really appreciate the speakers time today, Enid and Jared, you both did such a great job. So thank you for taking your time and, um, you know, shedding some light on this topic. Um, you know, to all the folks in the audience, we'll have a recording posted online. So if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out again. And I'm glad you could make it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks everybody for coming and thank you for hosting this. Thanks.